This is, uh, I guess, you know, the third in the, in this polar speaker series here at Rutgers. And if you've been to the first two, you know the first one was on, on permafrost, uh, building infrastructure on permafrost. The second one was on Arctic marine um, shipping. And this is the third one in, in the series. And I'm going to be talking about people, polar, polar peoples, migration, and population change uh, in the Arctic. But I'm going to start by talking very briefly about myself, give, give a little background as to where I'm, I'm coming from in terms of what I've done on the, on the Arctic um, primarily. I'm dating myself a little bit. I started my working career at the US Census Bureau in what was then called the Soviet branch, uh, where we did a, a variety of different types of geographic, demographic, economic analyses. I moved from there to the World Bank, this large international lending institution in Washington, D.C. Um, I worked on a variety of projects, mainly in the countries of, of Russia, the former Soviet Union. One of those was called the Northern Migration Project. Um, and we worked in, in different regions in northern Russia and Siberia, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that a little bit later. I moved from um, there to the University of Maryland, and I have a project called Move or Move by the State. Um, perspectives on relocation resettlement in the circumpolar north. Um, as Robin mentioned, I'm the editor of a journal called Polar Geography. I have some uh, copies of the journal here if any of you would, would like any of those. Um, and I'm also the, the lead author of a chapter on population migration for the upcoming Arctic Human Development Report. Geography is a quarterly peer-reviewed journal. We kind of span the uh, human and physical elements of um, of the polar, polar regions. Um, the journal has a long history. In fact, this is the cover of the first one. It started under the auspices of the American Geographical Society. This is this kind of old geographical society that really got its start by doing polar uh, some 150 years ago. Uh, one incentive I can give some of you people is that through June, we have free access to the most popular articles uh, in, in the the journal. Um, you can go to the website here, or I have my email address later. Uh, highly recommend this, this journal to all of you. Um, I'm going to divide my talk up into four parts. I'm going to start by talking about some of the factors influencing migration, population change in the Arctic. And then I'm going to take a bit of a historical approach. I'm going to start by talking about some of the historical patterns of migration in the, in the Arctic some of the recent trends, current status of the Arctic population, and then speculate a little bit about future population change in the Arctic. And I show this map here that shows right now, according to the definition of the, that we use of the Arctic, there's some 4 million people living in the region. And the, 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 the dots, the different color dots, show the, the population. There's some 700,000 people in, in Alaska, about 100,000 in the Canadian, 8,000 in Greenland, which I understand it's about the uh, student body of Rutgers University. So you take Rutgers University, the student body, it would fit in uh, spread out among all of Greenland. And it's the Russian Arctic that has some of the large cities um, in it. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that as well. But let me start by defining the Arctic. I mean, I'm primarily a, a human geographer. Um, you'll see I do a lot of work with, with data and numbers. I've been asked at different talks I've given, oh, where, where's, where are the boundaries of the Arctic? Where, what are the southern regions of the Arctic? And it's like, well, which, one, which ones do you want? I, mean, I can kind of answer that in a variety of ways. So different uh, groups, different, uh, there's a lot of different organizations involved in Arctic research, Arctic policy, define it differently. Uh, the blue is the Arctic Circle. Um, the, the, the red, or the, yeah, the red is, uh, what the Arctic uh, Marine Assessment Program uses. But the green is the one we use in the Arctic Human Development Report. Um, and you, if you look over here, basically from, from west to east, these are the regions I'm going to be talking about. I'll start by talking about a, a little bit about Alaska. This is the Yukon Territory. Northwest Territory is the new territory of Nunavut, which broke off from the Northwest Territory some 10 years ago. Um, Greenland, Iceland, the Faroe Islands, some of the northern of Norway, Finland, and Sweden, regions of Russia that border on the Arctic. So when I talk about the Arctic, it's these regions talking about. Um, and like I said, these are 23 or so regions divided among nine. I put countries in quotes because I include Greenland and the Faroe Islands, which are actually nominally under the, the control of, of Denmark. Um, so let me start by talking about some of these factors that, that affect um, 
migration and population change in the Arctic. Um, for those of you who aren't demographers, transition. And this is a transition that most societies, most countries go through, the transition from high birth rates and high death rates to lower birth rates and lower death rates. And I use this example for Greenland. It's kind of a classic demographic transition. Uh, back here, high birth rates, high death rates. Usually what happens is death rates fall first. And there's a period of rap the rapid population growth, and that's what's happened in Greenland. And you can see here, especially the death rates fluctuate quite a bit. And this is true of any kind of less advanced society. I mean, there's crop failures, there's all sorts of other diseases. And so the, the death rates fluctuate quite a bit. But what I'm going to emphasize here is, uh, and I'll, I'll split um, population change into two components. I'll split them into, of course, net migration. One of the things I'm going to emphasize in this talk is that in the Arctic, it's migration that's really been the main driver of, of population change. And one of those, is, of course, is global population change. And the, uh, hopefully this is the only acronym I'm going to give in this, use in this talk, and that's IPY, International Polar Year, and I'll refer to those. There's been four of those over time. The first one was in 1882, um, and the most recent one was in 2007 to 2009, and I took part in that, um, and um, I did, and as well as what some of my colleagues did. Um, another big driver of migration anywhere in the world, certainly in the Arctic, is differences in income, differences in, uh, among different regions. And you can see here this, this chart on the left shows the... Um, the GDP per capita among the different Arctic regions. You see here some of um, the Yamalna Nets, some of these Alaska, uh, Hantimanchi. These, these couple here are the oil and gas regions of West Siberia that's fueling a lot of Russia's current um, e economic growth. And so this, like I said, drives migration anywhere, but certainly also as well um, in the Arctic. Um, this is a talk within the climate and society groups. So I'm going to mention a, a few examples from the Arctic. Um, uh, this report came out about f uh, six or seven years ago, impacts of, of a warming Arctic, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment. Um, and I just went through and I kind of, this is almost a laundry list here of some of the impacts that are going to uh, impact on society from the changing um, uh, climate in the Arctic. Um, I, I'm not going to show the, the famous map of the world that shows the Arctic is you know, warming twice as fast as the global average. I guess Lawson probably showed the, the famous map of the, the, the diminishing sea ice. I, to your sophisticated audience, I don't need to go into that again. Um, but if you, if you go through this list and kind of mentally positive impacts, um, and, and some of these are, are negative, um, you know, disrupted transport on land. I mean, one of the things that's very important for Arctic, for the Arctic economy, is actually winter roads. Um, there's a lot of places that look across, across lakes, across rivers, across the tundra that really are only, uh, they can only transverse these in, in the winter time. And the, the time in the winter roads is quite a bit shorter. And I guess Kolya in his talk um, talked about uh, di diminishing permafrost, and certainly in Russia and other places. Um, a lot of these buildings are collapsing be, um, because of that. So anyway, so I, I, I mentioned this, and I'll kind of come back to this periodically um, during my talk. One of the famous or infamous ones, um, of, cor of course, are these, these um, barrier uh, or settlements built on barrier islands in, in Alaska. This is from the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment. That's a quote from the now late tenor, Senator Ted Stevens, there's little doubt that Alaskans are feeling the effects of climate change more than anywhere else in the nation, whether this is anthropogenic or take, take various steps. And so this rather long report listed a whole bunch of uh, assessment of the situation, but then what they were going to do about it. And there's a number of these along the, the coast of Alaska that are probably shouldn't have been built where they are, have to be resettled. And, some of these, they've agreed to resettle some of these, but they haven't agreed as to how, who's going to fund these. So it's going to be a problem um, going forward. Um, the role of the state, if you, if you have a kind of a continuum of migration from kind of completely free migration, people are able to go where they want to. On the other end is, is more state. And what we argue in this project, and this is a, a screenshot from our, our project website, Move or Move by the State, um, 
We kind of argue that in the circumpolar north, the state plays a bit of a larger role than, than it does elsewhere in the world. Um, this is some of the, the block housing in Nuuk, uh, which some of the Greenlanders were re resettled into. I, I list some of the, how the, the state plays a role in, in migration in the Arctic. Obviously, there's the Gulag. I'll talk a bit more about that. A lot of nomadic peoples that were forced into kind of a sedentary lifestyle, including here in, in Greenland, putting children into boarding schools, um, the consolidation of settlements for efficiency, and that uh, governments thought it, was, it would be more efficient if you didn't have these people spread out. We could provide services for them if they were um, resettled. Um, uh, obviously, the dew line, this is the distant early warning line that was in uh, North, North America during the during Cold War. Militarization, I mean, you, you asked his you know, hands on. Built a number of Air Force bases in, in North Greenland, um, displaced some of the indigenous peoples that were there. Um, uh, the high Arctic relocations in, in Canada, resettling some of these Inuits from, from um, Hudson Bay to the high Arctic. And this was Canada's attempt to, to kind of stake a claim to sovereignty over, over some of these islands. And they've, uh, they've recently, a couple of years ago, actually apologized for, for these relocations of these people. So moving on to historical patterns of migration, I show this headline from the Seattle Post Intelligencer about gold, gold, gold in, in the Yukon. I show this for a couple of reasons because, I mean, this is uh, I mean, what people went to the Arctic for in the first place, why they're still going, and why they will go to the Arctic in the future. Um, a lot of the, the people who went to the Arctic on, on th this is the, the Yukon gold rush, that was the Alaska gold rush about the same time, didn't make a lot of money. But um, certainly the city of Seattle, which is my from this, and it was really something that gave a rise to the economic development uh, of, of Seattle um, at that time. And I, I actually used to deliver this, this newspaper. I, I didn't deliver this particular edition, but <laughs> later on I delivered this newspaper. So anyway, keep, keep that in mind. Um, obviously, people have been migrating into or across the Arctic for a millennium. Um, after the last um, ice age, with the re receding of the, of the glaciers, people crossed the, the, the Bering Land Bridge up here in Alaska, first went south, and then later when this, this shelf um, uh, receded, there was subsequent migrations of, of Arctic peoples, the Dorset people, the Thule people. Um, I could give a whole lecture on that, but I'm uh, just one slide to, to um, illustrate the fact that the people have been migrating here for a long period of time, always been adapting to, like I said, for a long period of time. The, the Inuit population was estimated at about 72,000 in the mid-1800s, and this is the period of kind of initial um, contact with, with um, the situation now, I'm fast forwarding a little bit. Um, this is the percent indigenous in, in all the Arctic regions here. You can see Nunavut, the new territory, obviously has a rather large in, indigenous population. Greenland um, as well, lesser numbers in Alaska. And like I say here, this is partly because of migrations, or migrations but certainly also and probably more so the, the migration of outsiders. And you can see here um, in West Siberia, these are the, like I said, the oil and gas regions. There's been a huge influx of, of non-indigenous peoples, Russians and others, into these regions, kind of diluted the, the indigenous uh, percent of these, these regions. So to go back a little bit, um, the first international polar year took place in 1882. Um, this fellow, um nations should put aside their competition for mere geographical discovery um, and instead focus on a series of coordinated expeditions to, to scientific research. Basically what he's saying here is at this time in, in the late 1800s, there was kind of a competition to be the furthest north or the furthest south. I mean, people hadn't reached either of the poles and oftentimes what they were doing is, you know, I, I got to 81 degrees north, well, no, I competition. He, in, what he's saying is let's Let's stop that. Let's let's do research or the exploration in the name of science, and so they had a. It was small, but it was certainly a start. Um, a series of coordinated <coughs> observations, small number of countries, mostly physical observations, um, uh, things like that. 
Um, and this map here shows where some of these stations were in the, in the Arctic at that time. This, this book, um, if you're interested in this, I would highly recommend this, this book. But this was also the period of initial contact between um, outside Arctic natives and the period of kind of global in, in industrialization, but certainly also a lot of this took place in the, in the Arctic. Um, this map shows the, um, the kind of the Alaska native populations at the time of contact um, and the, the kind of different periods when they were uh, Europeans uh, encountered them. It's kind of, it went from the south to the north. And of course, the first Europeans to contact, make contact with these Alaska natives were Russians. Uh, Russia owned, of course, Alaska until they sold it to us in, in 1867. Uh, of about 88,000 Alaska Natives, Indians at that time, um, it has only increased 150 years to about. Um, what's happened over time is that obviously the, the population of Alaska has increased rather considerably, just a few thousand, a uh, few thousands down here. Um, kind of this little bump, and this was the, from the Alaskan Gold Rush, kind of a dip here. Um, increases certainly at the time of statehood. In 1950, of course, the Cold War started. We sent military personnel to Alaska. An another rather large jump here in 1970. This was after the, the Alaska pipeline was built and then kind of a continued um, increase after that. And of course, as, as you get these migrations into the Arctic, the, the percent of Alaska natives has dropped rather steadily over time. Now it's barely about 15, 18 percent of the population. But one of the points I want to make here about Alaska, um, Alaska, it, it's, it's, it's a place of outsiders. There's a lot of people who are born elsewhere. It has about the highest percent of, um, <clears throat> I don't want to say foreign born, but people born outside of the state of any state in the country. And this is true across the Arctic. You're going to see a lot of outsider populations um, in a lot of these, these Arctic regions. Consequences of this, um, this fellow um, Ernest or Tiger Birch um, did kind of a very interesting ethnographic study of Northwest Alaska. At the time in 1800, there was about 7,300 people living in this region, roughly the same geographic region. 200 years later, there's about 7,700 people. So the population is about the same over the last um, 200 years. And part of the reason for that is, is, is similar to anywhere in the world. When Europeans and others encountered some of these isolated um, groups of people, um, they, there was a, a detrimental effect. They weren't ex exposed to some of the diseases. Um, and, uh, uh, and another, I guess another point I want to make here, so this is the, the kind of population distribution back then um, and the population distribution now. You can see this big spike. This is Kotzebue. This is the regional center of the Northwest Arctic Arctic borough, and you, you're seeing a, a huge migration into a lot of the regional centers, both in Alaska and, as I'll point out, um, throughout the rest of the, the rest of the Arctic. Um, go north, young man. I mean, this was kind of the motto back then, and I, I, I'm not sexist. It was predominantly men. This is the age-sex distribution of, um, of Alaska in 1910. You had about two and a half. Uh, men for every, male for every, every female. Obviously, a lot of these were in the young, kind of working age um, in the largest numbers. And this, this is from a, a country music song. I will spare you singing this song because I, I wouldn't have any clue how to do it. But um, this is kind of the, the motto, go north, north to Alaska. Um, so there was a lot of people who went there. There's kind of an interesting pattern or relationship between uh, the U.S. unemployment rate and um, mi migration patterns into Alaska. Uh, when the U.S. unemployment rate is high, migration to Alaska is high, and then the opposite. But there's also things going on in Alaska at the time. You can see down here at the end, um, this is the, the recent Great Recession, and, and I'll show you in a minute what happened there. But like I said, um, Populations change because of differences in births and death rates, but they also change because of migration. But migration is the component of population change that really affects these Arctic populations here. And you can see the blue is the difference between births and deaths in Alaska, rather steady. The yellow shows the, um, 
the patterns of, of net migration. You can see here the kind of buildup at the end of World War II in Alaska, the Korean War, Vietnam War, a lot of people went there, certainly the pipeline construction, the end of pipeline construction, the oil boom, the oil bust, uh, recovery, and then here the Great Recession. So, you know, <clears throat> while the rest of the country is, is in doldrums, or so, so to speak, I mean, there's, Alaska draws a lot of people up there. So you can see here, and I show this for Alaska, but I'll show this for other Arctic regions, it's migration of people that really drive a lot of the population um, change. <clears throat> um, uh, and this is the, uh, the Canadian North, the situation there. Uh, for a long time, it was under the control of the Hudson Bay. A lot of fur trading, a lot of whaling. These weren't activities that drew a, a large population, large outside population. Um, the search for the Franklin Expedition, the Canadian Archipelago, gained a lot of valuable knowledge. And this is actually really uh, uh, the, the American Geographical Society got its, its start with the, uh, assist in some of these. But it was the Yukon Gold Rush that started the, the permanent population boom. And I don't know if you know what this is. This is the Chilkoot Trail. Um, this is in the panhandle of Alaska. And if you get to the top of this, there's the Canadian, Royal Canadian Mounted Police are up at the top. Because this is actually the border between Canada and Alaska. And it, the border was a bit vague. I mean, there was no reason to really define the border. But at this time, they, th they thought, oh, if there's thousands of of people coming across, we need to collect customs duties and things like that. And so this, this actually didn't take place for that long. It was a, a two or three year period. But like I said, it was the beginning of the permanent population in the, in the Canadian North. Later on, World War II and the building of the Alcan Highway brought in um, even, even more people. And so this shows kind of what's happened to the, the population in northern Canada over time. Yukon Territory, this was the first time the Canadian census had been extended to, to northern Canada. You had about 30,000 people. Then after the, the gold rush was over, you had this kind of drop in the population. So the Yukon wouldn't have this many people living in it again until 1991, until 90 years later. Um, Northwest Territory is a similar pattern. Then you get the, the new territory of Nunavut, which broke off from the, the Northwest um, Territories. Um, and it was, you know, obviously during the, the Yukon Gold Rush, you had the red shows the outsider, the non-native population. About two-thirds of the population was these people from outside. They left, there was, but there was still a foothold of a permanent outsider population. Um, and that's, as development has taken place in the Canadian North, you get more and more people from outside. So you get roughly 50-50 uh, natives and, well, indigenous and then outsiders. And when I go to the Canadian North, I mean, the first question I ask my professional colleagues, is because I know they're not from, most of them are not from the Yukon, they're not from the North Territories, they're from somewhere, somewhere else. So I'm kind of moving around uh, the circumpolar north to Iceland. Iceland was completely uninhabited until 874 or about there. There's some dispute. Uh, it was under Norwegian or Danish rule until about 1944, and then broke away and became. For most of Iceland's history, it's been a rather poor country, dependent on fishing, um, some livestock herding, until, of course, quite recently. Um, the population, over half of it, lives in, in Reykjavik. Or, uh, most of the country is rather pretty, pretty empty uh, as well. Um, for somebody like me who uses numbers, I, I was like this. Iceland was the first country in the world to conduct a complete population census um, in 1703. And most of these countries, uh, the, the, these northern Arctic countries, actually have quite good statistics. In fact, the Nordic countries have what are generally regarded as among the best um, statistical systems. And this shows what's happened to the population of, of Iceland over time. About 50,000 at the time of the first census in 1703. Not much population increase um, until uh, the early 1900s, and then the population kind of took off after that. So rather slow growth, and then until quite quite recently. Um, and this this chart shows that those two components of population change that I mentioned: natural increase and net migration. Uh, the red shows the difference between the number of births and deaths. The blue shows uh, the difference between in-migrants and out-migrants. And you can see here these kind of fluctuations. Uh, these are probably uh, 
different, different famines that they had, different, uh, different diseases that kind of went, went rampant through the, the populations. Um, and some of these, I don't know exactly, but some of these could have been, you know, it's, it's Iceland. Some of these could have been volcanic eruptions that caused massive crop failures. Um, and you can see here the different kind of migrations that have taken place over time. In the late 1800s, there was a large migration of not just people from Iceland, but all the Nordic countries, most of Europe. This is a, an Ellis Island's heyday when there was a lot of people migrating um, to, to North America. Then you can see here the, the birth rates begin to kind of take off, and this is a period of population growth. Uh, a couple, but you can see here what's happened to migration periods of high in migration, high out migration. This one's kind of interesting. This was during the, the early 2000s when Iceland, the economy was booming. Um, you know, they thought that the money would come flow and keep flowing in forever, and then that was that big spike was followed by this, this kind of exodus of, of people. And, and some of these are Icelanders either going or coming, but certainly Iceland had, had and still has a, a, a somewhat significant um, outside of the population living in it as well. Um, Greenland, Greenland, of course, was a, a, a Danish settlement, or Danish settlement started in Greenland in, in 1721. Uh, Denmark actually adopted a very paternalistic policy, a very, and in fact, they didn't allow people to actually go to Greenland very much um, until after the period after World War II, uh, when it became actually a county within Denmark. Um, but later on, there was um, uh, a home rule was established, and this, and, and they've, they've, Greenland over time has kind of and I would guess, I mean, the, the, the path seems to be that Greenland will eventually become fully independent. And this is some of the typical housing um, that you'll see in Greenland, uh, the local housing, like kind of Disneyland and so to speak. Um, Greenland is kind of interesting. It does not define people based on any type of ethnic or racial characteristics. It defines people simply on where you were born born in Greenland or not in Greenland. And you can see here, uh, up until about the, you know, the 1940s, it was predominantly that Denmark didn't allow a lot of people to, to move to Greenland. So it was mostly a, a, a Greenland, Greenlander population. Um, and then there was kind of allowed some, some in-migration to the country. And that's actually dropped. As the, the Danish migration has actually slowed down uh, a bit into Greenland recently. Um, there's a very, and I, I, I have to do this kind of quickly, but there's a very complex relationship between climate, society, sex ratios, technology, and kind of other factors um, going on in, in Greenland. Um, this shows the sex ratio, uh, the number of males per 100 females in Greenland over, over a rather long period of time. You can see here, back in seven, 1780, there were 75 males for every 100 females. I mean, any society should be, at birth, you should have roughly 105 males to 100, every 100 females. Um, and then as time goes on, men die earlier, and, and so it even evens out. Um, and a lot of this had to do with men were doing a lot of the hunting, rather primitive me methods. They had much, much higher mortality rates. Um, and later on, they, they were given guns, and so it became a little bit safer here. Um, to, to hunt. Um, there's a rather complex relationship between the rising sea temperatures um, and the, the, the different resources. There was cod that became brought more into. Um, with modernization, there was a lot more canning that was done. Women migrated out of the country um, because the female jobs were, were disappearing. So you've gone from a situation where you have a, a deficit of males to now you almost have a, a surplus of, of men in the in, um, in, in Greenland taking place. But I want to talk a little bit about Russia uh, or the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was the country and still is the country that has the largest Arctic population. Um, it's gone through a number of different phases over time, how Russia has peopled their, put people into the Arctic, into, into Siberia. There's kind of the pre-Soviet period, and I show this, <clears throat> people having lunch, and this is on the Trans-Siberian Railway, on their way to, in, in Irkutsk, on their way to some place in the, in the Russian Far East. So there was a lot of voluntary migration to these places, but it was really during the, after the Soviet, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, the kind of push to industrialize the Soviet Union as rapidly as possible, a lot of this was based on the resources of the Arctic. 
And of course, the first phase that they did was the, the opening up of the, of the north. And a lot of this was done with forced labor. And I show this picture here of Gulag labor building um, the railway to Murmans, the guards standing here. Um, later on, there was various forms of wage increments. You could get double or triple the wage it, that you could in, in the, the mainland, the, the Matarik, they call it, uh, later uh, trying to uh, improve living standards. And the, the title of our project is Move by the State, but in Russia, it's really not a matter of move by the state. It's more a matter of abandoned by the state. In this book, The Sub Siberian Curse, How Communist Planners Left uh, Rush Out in the Cold, really kind of exemplifies this. It, the, the kind of main thesis of this, this book is that Russia inherited a non-market spatial distribution of economic activity and its population, and that still happens to this day. Um, this shows what some of these, the, the, the different labor camps in, in Russia, what, where they took place. This is uh, Dalstroy, the Far East Construction Company. Um, this is a camp of complete isolation, it's called. Um, so much of Siberia, much of the north, and the development was controlled by these, these um, trust companies or these, these camps. And so there was, like I said, millions of people were sent to the Arctic. Um, much of the early development of this region was controlled was, was done based on gulag labor. And there was you know, millions and millions of people there a lot of times to get to Magadan here. They were sent on the Trans-Siberian Railway and then kind of shipped up here. Mortality rates were obviously very high. And if they were, they would just try and go get, get more people. Um, the other thing that took place, or the other th aspect of, of development in, this, in, in Siberia and, and the, in the Russian Arctic was the development of the North Sea. Fleet, the, uh, from Murmansk, from Archangels, using some of these great Siberian rivers, which all flow, of course, into the Arctic. Uh, and this was, uh, you know, a, a very heavily subsidized, but uh, rather prominent aspect of, of Arctic Siberian development. Uh, in the post-Soviet period, the, the, the shipments along this, this, the North Sea route diminished quite, quite a bit. But actually, in the last couple of years, have actually revived. A lot of this are foreign vessels. I think Lawson Brigham spoke about this earlier. And so, what happened uh, uh, in in the Russian Arctic was they built these huge cities, much more, much larger cities than elsewhere in the Arctic. And you can see some of these. This is 1897. This is the time of the last Soviet census, or the last Tsar census, then the first Soviet census. I mean, they built these things from almost nothing. Huge cities, Murmansk and Archangels and these others. Um, some of these down here in green are actually some of the oil and gas towns in West Siberia. And these didn't exist at all until about, about 30 or 40 years ago. Um, like I point out down here, of, of there's 12 cities in the, in the Arctic, as I define it, with a population of 100,000 or more. All but one are in the Russian North or the Russian Arctic. The only exception is Anchorage, Alaska, which people could argue is the, the climate is not really, um, not really Arctic. Um, to the North, I mean, one of the things I did when I worked at the World Bank, and we had this project, we, we did a, a, an inter interview with people and asked them, why, why did you go to the North? Uh, why did you go to these places to work? And to go back in time, like I said, I worked at the Soviet branch, so I, I do go back a little ways in time here. I mean, this was a closed economy. I mean, you couldn't travel into or out of the country um, very easily. Um, there wasn't a lot of ways, I mean, there's a whole centrally planned, there wasn't a lot of ways to legitimately make a, a high wage. And certainly going to the Arctic, going to Siberia to work was one of them. And there's this long list of northern benefits, these benefits from relocating to the Arctic, for working in the Arctic. Uh, you got early retirement, all these benefits. You could jump the housing queue when you retired. Um, so it was a very effective the means of getting people there, and it, and it worked quite a bit. So obviously a lot of people, they moved to the north to make money, or they moved with a family. And some of them said it's a desire to see the world, or romanticism. I mean, there was a lot of pride in, in, in helping develop the Soviet economy by working in the north. And so what happened when the country broke up, there was what, what we refer to as a triple transition. There was the transition away from a centrally planned economy towards a market economy. There was certainly the breakup of the Soviet Union, which, which contributed to this, because a lot of the people that worked in the North were people from outside of Russia. And so all of a sudden, there was a large Ukrainian population. They wanted to get back to their, their own country. And, and in the, during the Soviet period, you had to get a permit to, to travel to migrate from place to place or to move from place to place. And 
suddenly you had freedom of movement. You could travel wherever you, you wanted to. And so this is what happened. Um, this is over a roughly 20 year period from the, break, uh, the end of the Soviet period until quite recently. And you, all these regions in the orange and red are places where you had huge out migration, green where you had in migration, places like here. This is Magadan, you had about 55% of the population leave over this period. Um, Chukotka, just across the, the Bering Strait from Alaska, had a, saw about a migration of 75% of the population over this period. So rather huge exodus um, from these regions. Um, and like I see here, the Russian state kind of withdraws from uh, development of, of the, the Soviet, uh, of, of the Russian North. Um, this, this total about 3% of GDP, all these different northern entitlements, the northern shipment, that's the, the, the shipment of food. Um, a lot of this burden was shifted to the, to the private sector, or to the regions. And this is an article from the New York Times that I was interviewed for. Um, and this is, there was another root financial crisis in Russia in 1958. The ruble went from um, 6 to 1 to 25 to 1 in, in the matter of a couple days. Um, and, and a lot of these, these regions were actually going abroad to, to buy the food and fuel and they couldn't afford it. So th this title appeared in the headline in the New York Times, Forsaken in the Russian Arctic, Nine Million Stranded Workers. And you see what's happened here, this, this northern shipment, so to speak, as a percent of GDP, which slipped to almost nothing. Um, so the, 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 how the Soviet Union developed its northern Arctic regions was basically became unsustainable in Russia's um, market e economy. And so the northerners voted with their feet. And so we did another survey of people who had lived in the north and migrated out of there, and these were some of the answers. We always viewed our, our stay in the north as, as temporary. It became senseless to live in the, in the north, and we want to get back to our native places, our native peoples. And like I said, a lot of these Arctic regions are composed of outsiders, people who, people who retain social, other ties um, outside the region. And these two maps show, the first one shows migration between the two censuses, um, and this one shows the, um, the, the change with a post-secondary education, and they do kind of mirror each other. Not surprisingly, I mean, it's obviously, for most migration streams, it's people with a, a higher education who move in the, in the largest numbers. So the waters of archipelago Russia rise. There was this fellow, Leslie Dinish, who wrote this book on Archipelago Russia, and what, what, he, what he was saying in, this, in this, this article or series of articles is that the Russian Siberia is like, is like a, a series of islands, a series of economic islands, not very well connected with, the, with each other, and he was right. I mean, they, they aren't very well connected. You have to fly into a lot of these places, um, and what happened when the Soviet Union broke up and they could no longer afford this is there was a, a huge decline simply in the number of places people, people lived. Um, when, the, when Russia went to do its first population census in 2002, its first census as an independent country, um, about 12% of the places where they thought there was somebody living had been abandoned or, or basically closed down. In Magadan, it was about 42% of the settlements within Magadan had just been simply uh, uh, abandoned. Um, there was a huge migration out of the, the other parts of Magadan into Magadan City, even though the city of Magadan um, declined in large um, numbers itself. Um, and one of the, I, I do this work on this project with a number of anthropologists. And we have kind of different methods. We ask different questions. They, they ask questions about, <clears throat> to people, do you like this region or do you not like this, this region? Oh, people, oh yes, I love this, this place, I'll stay here. But I look, you know, kind of pragmatically at migration data. Okay, you can say you like this place, but what did you actually do? Um, and these two maps show, and this is 1989, this is the last Soviet census, um, this is 2002, the first Russian census, the, the population by place of birth, and you see the ones in red are those where there's a huge outsider population living in them. And then if you look ahead here, it's only these two. These are, the, again, the oil and gas regions, the kind of wealthy regions of West Siberia. Um, a lot of these like Murmansk, uh, Magadan, these places, it was the outsider population that left. So out, out of the total population of 1.4 million between these censuses, 1.3 million was of people who, were, who, let, who resided or had, were born elsewhere, had some, retained some social time uh, elsewhere in the country. 
And what's happened is that um, Uh, the, the Russian government and a lot of the regional governments developed these um, migration assistance programs. And these were programs because the population was older, less educated, less mobile. Um, it was a burden on the Russian state, the new Russian state, to um, maintain this large population size. Um, so there was all these programs that were developed. And one of the ones, that, like I said, I worked on at the World Bank was this northern restructuring project of um, the Russian government approached the World Bank and took out a rather large loan of some $80 million um, to resettle people from three different regions, from the Vorkuta region. This is a, a coal mining town in West Siberia, from, from Norilsk, um, which is in the Taimir Okrug, rather, um, actually a rather profitable uh, palladium nickel plant. And then here in Susamon, the gold, gold mining region of, of Magadan, um, the project, I can say this, I don't work at the World Bank anymore, uh, didn't work that well. Um, it resettled some people, but it was not um, to the extent that they had obviously envisioned. And this is another example of the role of the state, and it's, just, it's a rather difficult um, thing to do. Uh, part of the reason was the project just took a long time to implement. So some of the recent trends, uh, current status of the, of the Arctic population, this shows um, Greenland, uh, the cap, or excuse me, 17,000 people live here, about a third of the population of Greenland. This shows, this is the airport in Greenland. These are some of the block housing that I showed you before the picture of in, in downtown Greenland. And um, it currently contains about one third of the population of Greenland, but I the amount of housing that they want to, you may get 90% of the population of Greenland um, concentrating here in the capital of, of Nuuk. Um, one of the things I have to do in this Arctic Human Development Report is to look at change between the, this is the second Arctic Human Development Report, so I have to look at change since the first one. And I put all the numbers together, and I, I was kind of surprised that the population in the Arctic has stayed about the same over the last decade. Um, but as a geographer, you have to look a little further, and obviously there's been huge differences. Um, Alaska, Iceland, the Canadian Arctic actually have population increases more than the world average. I mean, the world population continues to grow rather rapidly. Other places um, you know, have not much gain or small losses. But it's the Russian Arctic that has had, continues to have this large depopulation of the population. It's slowed down since the 1990s, but it's, there's still a huge exodus of people taking, taking place. Um, to look at it at kind of another geographic scale, a little bit lower, geographic scale. Um, the red shows where people are, where the population is declining. Blue show where there's increase. You can see here in Alaska and around Anchorage, this area, there's increases. This is White Horse, um, uh, Yellowknife in some of these places. Um, even within Greenland, I mean, the, around Nuke, around some of these other towns, there's been increases. But much of the rest of Greenland, there's been a population decline. Um, most of the, the Russian Arctic still, or excuse me, the yeah, Russian Arctic, there's still population declines taking place, except for some of these little blue dots. And these, again, are the oil and gas regions that are um, uh, so prosperous to this day. Um, one of the trends that we're seeing in a lot of the Arctic regions is this. The, these two maps show this is domestic migration in the Nordic countries. And when I say domestic, this is migration to within the country. Um, so you can see the reds are out of most of the northern regions of um, of uh, the, the Norway, Sweden, and Finland here are losing people. Obviously, around the capital regions, the southern regions, there's population increases. But at the same time, what you're seeing is an international migration into a lot of these these different um, different regions. I mean, this is taking place kind of everywhere, and you see this phenomenon across the Arctic. If you go um, to to Barrow, there's a lot of uh, large Thai population. Um, when I was in the Yukon Territory recently, um, a lot of the labor force is, is Filipino. Young people in Yukon don't want to work there. They won't accept the wages, and so they import people until quite recently. Of course, uh, a lot of Poles um, in Iceland and everywhere elsewhere. Um, I mean, the same thing is taking place in, in, our, uh, in the Russian north as well. Um, and this chart kind of shows this for the Scandinavian countries at large large Thai populations in a lot of these regions. 
Um, this is um, a Thai restaurant in, in Nuuk, probably one of the better restaurants in, in all of Greenland. Um, I, did, I was there in, in August, and I did explain to this woman, the, type, the name of your restaurant is Charian Porn. I have to submit an expense statement with porn on this, and it's, it's rather difficult. And she was a very polite Thai woman. She just kind of laughed and, and let that one go. Um, like I said, uh, in, the, in the Russian north, you get the same, the same phenomenon. Uh, and the, again, these are the oil, oil and gas regions, rather large uh, foreign population. A lot of these are Central Asians. Um, this is Chukotka, and if you remember back, this is a place where you had about 75% of the population leave, um, and it's been replaced by a large um, uh, foreign workforce. I know a lot of these people are actually, a lot of the laborers are from Central Asia, a lot of people doing the housing, the construction of housing um, in Chukotka, and across the Russian north are actually Turks, for <coughs> whatever reason. Um, <coughs> some of the historic, like I said, if you look, if you go back in time, go back 70, 80 years, there was a huge excess of males over females, a lot of the Russian North. That has diminished a bit over time, but there's still a much larger, and if you look at the, uh, we're using the kind of sexist colors, blue for boys and pink for little girls. Um, you know, in most of these places, there's, there's uh, an excess of males over females, except for some of the kind of larger, larger settlements. Um, if, you, if you kind of drill down a, a little bit, you go down to some of the smaller settlements in Greenland, um, and some of these is some work that a colleague of mine has done. I mean, there's 140 males for every 100 females in some of these smaller, smaller villages with all the kind of possible problems that go along um, with that. So it's men, men leave the, the north, uh, they leave the Arctic, but women tend to leave on a much, on a much more permanent basis in a lot of these regions. Um, so the future of the Arctic is certainly going to be in the cities. You're seeing this pattern. I've kind of shown this everywhere. Um, the, this is the, the population growth in the cities and settlements. Again, Anchorage, places like this, Whitehorse, Yellowknife. And you can see here, like in, in Greenland, population growth in Nuuk, population growth in Lulusat. But you look along the coast, a lot of these smaller settlements, people are leaving in, in large numbers. Certainly the Russian Arctic around here, there's continued population decline. Um, except for these, these kind of pockets of pro prosperity. Um, same, same thing is going on in Greenland, this kind of, or excuse me, Iceland, this kind of continued in-migration to the capital city, kind of a, almost a depopulation of, of much of the rest of the country. And this is, again, pictures from this summer. This is the, the Nuuk Center, the mall in, in, in Nuuk, um, maybe the only mall in all of, all of Greenland. And you can see here the rather typical young people hanging out at the mall. Um, you know, the bright lights in the big city are attracting young people in Greenland like they do um, everywhere. Um, so to look or to speculate maybe a little bit on the future of the Arctic, um, this is the, the cover of a book by Larry Smith, and if you, any of you are geographers and are going to go to the um, American Association of Geographers annual meeting, um, Larry's going to be giving a talk there. Um, and and I, I, I know Larry, um, and this is not his book, The World in 2050, How the Northern uh, countries are going to come to dominate. Um, he, he doesn't envision cities of a million people on ice. This is what his publisher uh, wanted to put, put up here. So we're, that's not quite what we're, we're predicting. Um, but obviously resource development is going to be driving a lot of the future um, development, but also certainly a lot of the population change in the, in the Arctic. And you can see here some, a lot of these are already um, partially underway oil and gas development here, aluminum smelters here, aluminum smelters in yeah, East Iceland. Of course, you know, this is in, in, in West Siberia. And I mean, how these go about being developed is certainly a, going to be a, a, a key for the global, local, and certainly also the local economy. I mean, how this takes place, or local economies, and certainly also the local populations. Um, and I'm broad brushing this, but we could certainly drill down to other regions and see how this is taking place. Um, the future of the Arctic, this was an article that I wrote that came out just actually this week on the future of the Arctic. Um, I don't know if it's any sign of anything, but I'm last in the article on population issues is also the last one in the, in the whole issue. Um, but to kind of summarize um, some of the things that they say in, the, in these, these series of articles, I mean, more countries are becoming interested in, in the Arctic. I mean, you get China, you get all these other ones that have some 
uh, development interest in the Arctic. And obviously, um, as you get more countries, you get more, more people from these regions coming to the Arctic. Lawson Brigham talked uh, in his previous one. I mean, we, we see this, the opening up of the, or the diminishing Arctic sea ice, but a lot of this, it, the true development is going to be driven by economics. Is it really economically feasible to, to send ships um, across the Arctic? Um, and, you know, he points out, and others point out, that the opening of, the, of like, the North Sea Route, it's, it's mainly taking place in the summer. It's going to be quite a bit of, of, uh, <coughs> of sea ice there. And uh, the, other, the other point, I mean, when we talk about the Arctic countries, um, you know, these are advanced countries or peaceful countries for the most part. Um, so development in the Arctic is proceeding somewhat orderly, and this even includes Russia. Um, R Russia knows that its future lies in the Arctic, and it's kind of it wants to to, to play in this this game, so to speak. Um, so if we if we project uh, the future of the Arctic populations, um, you know, based on current trends, it looks like the Arctic population is going to be um, larger. It's going to be older. I mean, the, the Arctic is encountering the same aging problems, aging issues as elsewhere. Increasingly urban, I mean, you're seeing this. I mean, the world just passed a threshold of over half the global population now lives in cities. And I mean, the Arctic passed that threshold a long time ago because of the, the nature of development. It's, it's much more urban. Um, but a lot of these standard projections uh, methods don't really work that well in the Arctic, um, in part because of the volatility of, of migration. Um, and I show this, this is the projections of the population of Alaska. Like I said, Alaska has about 700,000 people. And it, um, it's projected to get up to, you know, could uh, potentially have over a million people by, um, by 2035. And most of the, if, if you look at the, the standard population projections uh, for most of the Arctic countries, they do show this increase except for, for Russia. But on total, you're going to have a, a much larger um, population in the Arctic. Um, the implications of that for these young people in Greenland kind of skipping around um, these different icebergs is uh, a bit uncertain. So I'll stop there and take any questions that you might have. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, is I'm sorry. The question was, what are the, what are some of the challenges in getting um, good census data from some of these these Arctic regions, um, as opposed to say the the more southern regions of these countries? Um, I, I I would almost say there aren't really any. I mean, we talked a little bit about some of the nomadic populations, but I mean these these a lot of these countries they they do they they do a census at times when there are when they know that there are populations. Um, present in a lot of these areas because of the kind of seasonal or, no, or no, nomadic type of, of migration. Um, I've talked to people, it's kind of interesting to kind of almost reverse your, your question a little bit. I mean, these are rather small populations. Um, and like the Yukon Territory has some 32,000 people in it. Um, the, the problem there is, is that like when, when Statistics Canada does a survey, then the Yukon Territory does a survey. It's almost the problem. These people get oversampled. I don't know if you, as an American, we're 320 million people. How often you get uh, approached by the Census Bureau? These people are getting oversampled in some ways. I mean, they, they're, you know, you can sample people by mail and other things, and most of these people are well connected. So it's it's almost the opposite problem. It's not lack of data. It's it's almost an abundance of data in some respects. <laughs> 